The Powering Through podcast is brought to you by National Cornerstone Healthcare Services, a subsidiary of NCHS Holdings Incorporated. NCHS is a full-service health organization, which, through its affiliates, includes an accredited specialty pharmacy founded to serve people with hemophilia and other blood disorders and to optimize patient quality of life by providing personalized healthcare services in addition to pharmacy services. NCHS makes independence the goal for people with chronic disorders. They believe the home or an alternate non-clinical setting is the best place to receive treatments, which is why they do so much more than just fill prescriptions. Patients of NCHS can also expect medication therapy management, coordination of nursing services, and much more, including translation services for non-English speakers. Learn more about NCHS's services and the team who provides them by visiting nchswecare.com. Once again, that's nchswecare.com. Everybody needs an advocate. Because I'm not there 24-7. Families that have hemophilia mature faster. I've been feeling a lot of anxiety lately. I'm so tired of being strong. To understand how far we've come helps you appreciate where we are now. No is just no for this person. Somebody's going to say yes sooner or later. And it helps you understand that there are more steps to be taken in the future. You're the first person I've met with a bleeding disorder. Let's fight the disease and not the people who have it. Hello, and welcome to Episode 8 of the Powering Through Podcast, featuring panel conversations on obstacles, challenges, and what it takes to overcome, held for the benefit of the bleeding disorders community. The Powering Through Podcast is sponsored by NCHS, produced by Bloodstream Media, and I am your host, Patrick James Lynch. Remember to subscribe to the Powering Through Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever it is that you listen to podcasts to have the most recent episode delivered directly to you, and you can visit poweringthrough.org to see videos, photos, and other podcasts from all of our Powering Through events. In this episode, we give a listen to our Powering Through conversation featuring NFL Super Bowl champion Josh Gordy and DEA agent Justin Moore, who appeared on Spike TV's television series DEA Detroit, for a conversation that took place this August as part of the Texas Bleeding Disorders Conference. The wide-ranging conversation touched on topics such as managing the loss of parents, adapting to new environments, being pushed to the limits of one's physical and mental toughness, handling stigma and negative perception, the importance of belonging to a team, and the importance of setting long- and short-term goals. All that and more coming up in just a moment here on the Powering Through Podcast. One quick bit of housekeeping before we dive into the heart of the episode. I want to thank all the listeners who have helped make these first eight episodes of the Powering Through Podcast possible. Bloodstream Media and NCHS create these pods for you, the community, to have a resource, to learn from, to be entertained by, and to expose you to various ways of thinking about and approaching challenges in your life. As a huge believer in the power of podcasts, I am very happy that we've been able to turn this live panel series into a podcast for you all, and I'm excited to continue doing so. But I need your help. I need your help to make sure that we keep reaching more people. Because while awareness of podcasts is at an all-time high, there are still many people who don't exactly know what they are or how to find them. And sometimes I meet community members who have never heard of podcasts, and I just know that they are exactly the type of people who would benefit from listening to pods like the Powering Through Podcast. So you're listening. You obviously figured out how to engage with podcasts. Nicely done. Very good work. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Please leave us a review on iTunes if you haven't already. And please help one person find their way to listening to this episode. Maybe a young community member you know who's big into sports and would appreciate hearing from a Super Bowl champion. Or a community parent who belongs to law enforcement and might particularly appreciate Justin's points of view. I'm a proponent of the value of these things. And I'm a believer in the power of community. If our community gets behind pushing out podcasts as a form of communicating, educating, and empowering one another, we will be stronger and better for it. Okay, that's the end of my pitch. Thanks for listening to the Powering Through Podcast. And now let's get into this month's conversation featuring NFL Super Bowl champion Josh Cordy and DEA agent Justin Moore. So I want to start with um, Justin with you. you uh, you're, you're from Texas originally, small town Texas, talked about how playing football is a way of life. Can you just give us a little background to growing up here in Texas? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I grew up in Pittsburgh, Texas, if anybody knows where that is. About 3,000 people. So everybody here that's from Texas knows what that means. That means Fridays and nothing but football. Watch football from the moment I was born and, and, and then I played through high school uh, there, here in Texas. So I'm proud of that and, and um, I'm glad to be back here. You played in the NFL. You played in college, Justin. At what point did you realize, like, this is actually going to be a substantial part of my life? Just growing up, like I say, it was a culture, you know, growing up around it. You just knew you was going to play football. You know, my older brother played, older cousins played. 
But I will say once I did get an opportunity, got it was you know get a blessing to have a scholarship to go to college to play football. I say, man, well maybe I would have I got some kind of talent. So you know maybe a maybe something here, you know, and just put forth all my effort I could and see how far I can go with it. Similar for me growing up, my family was all football all the time. It's all we did. So I knew early that it was something I was going to do. I like to eat, so it was, it was natural for me to play. Unlike Josh, I wasn't talented enough to go to really big schools and do all that, so I had to force my way onto campuses and try to get on and, you know, with whatever I, team I could. So I found a small school in Virginia, uh, Division three school that I played at. I love the uh, experience of that environment, and what I mean is we're not there. You can't play for the, the fans or the money, of course. You know, it's all about each other and, and the teamwork. And to me, man, that was really, really cool. Those four years were very special. To go back to you, Josh, you know, it's easy for us to say, and it's, you know, look, NFL Super Bowl champion, right? That's not a small thing. That's an amazing accomplishment. Congratulations on being one of the few people in the world for whom that title uh, is appropriate. But we've talked about this before. It wasn't a golden path for you. No one rolled out the red carpet. You've kind of had to fight and scrap for every accomplishment you had in your athletic career. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of of that journey? Yeah, sure. Um, Definitely in high school. was nowhere near the, the best guy on the team. You know, I'm sure a lot of probably a lot of kids in here may be in that similar situation. But the one thing I did stay constant to and true was, you know, making sure that whatever I did get on the field, I did put forth all my effort. You know, the opportunity presented itself. You know, it, whatever you're going through in life, it, whatever you, whenever you have an opportunity, you just you got to walk through that door and take it. Starting safety, he had a sprung, a sprained ankle. I was playing receiver at the time. They need someone to fill in the gap. You know, they said, well, this guy, he got some good speed. Why don't we just put him back there, see if he can, <laughs> you know, see if he can tackle. And a long story short, it was kind of, you know, the history in the making there in high school and went on to, uh, you know, g- <clears throat> gain a full scholarship to Central Michigan University, where when I went up there, you know, again, similar situation. I was behind a lot of guys. Um, and again, another opportunity presented itself. The guys who was in front of me, they end up for, for whatever reason quitting, leaving school. So again, I was, you know, put into that spot, and you know, on down the road, I end up being a four-year starter there at Central Michigan. From there, I got an opportunity to play on the biggest stage in the world. So you've got to find some motivation to keep yourself ready. You've just got to have that motivation to get up, do your work, do it every day, right. so that that when that moment presents itself, you can step up. What influences in your life led you to have that kind of discipline so that you were ready when these opportunities presented themselves? Just thinking about when I was younger, man, the coaches, one of, the, one of their main lines were, you know, when it's time to, when the time to perform has come, the time to prepare has passed. So you got to always, you know, be ready, you know, be on ready because once that guy in front of you goes down, hey, it's on you now. You got to fill in that void and you're only as good as your backup. So I didn't want to be that guy who let the, let the team down, let my family down. Just wanted to be accountable for my teammates, I think, were the main thing. You know, whatever I could do to, to contribute to the team was, was my attitude. And Justin, you moved from, you went to school in Virginia, being originally from Pittsburgh, Texas here. You had some familial challenges in your life that came up, and actually going even further back, you had some other challenges, a couple big big challenges in your life growing up. Could you speak a little bit to those and, and how those influenced you? What he, we're talking about originally, uh, when I was six years old, um, it was me, my sister, and my mother, and my father. Uh, and uh, he, he died tragically in a, in a traffic accident when I was six. As a six-year-old boy, you know, uh, originally that's a very devastating moment, obviously. You know, I was, I was very uh, nervous about my mother and uh, you know, I, I worried about her a lot. I remember in school just sitting there worrying that something was going to happen to her while I was gone. So I went through that stage. I, 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 I worked my way through it. And, and for me, the way I work through adversity is I, I have a, a, a purpose in my mind or a why do I need to fight this. At six years old, <laughs> you don't have a lot of things to draw of, but I had my mother and my sister. And that was my purpose and my why. And I, and I remember thinking, I, I, you know, in my little mind, I'm now the man of the house, and I got to take over, and I got to <laughs> make sure everybody's okay. You know, years went by, my mother remarried, and then you spoke about when I went to college. When I was 18, uh, starting my sophomore year there, uh, my stepfather died in a tragic accident also. Again, I worried about them being by themselves, and uh, what am I going to do now? To I'm, I'm in Virginia, they're in Texas, and so I had a kind of a different, uh, you know, set of problems to worry about, the distance and, and all that good stuff. So... For me, I had to think in my mind, what is, what is it that, I need, that I'm trying to accomplish right now? What do I have to accomplish? What I ultimately come up with 
um, my teammates in college, my friends in college, um, my mother's support with me staying in college, you know, through that, um, I was able to, once again, uh, drawing off all of that, uh, recover from those two, uh, you know, tragedies uh, that my family had to endure. You've heard from NCHS about the services they provide to their patients. Now they'd like you to meet one of those patients, Joe. When Joe first moved to St. Louis, it was a bit of a shock. It's a big city, he was looking for a job. He didn't have much time to try to figure out his new insurance policy or figure out how he'd continue to receive his factor. Joe made a call to an NCHS rep he met at a conference, Kara, and Kara helped Joe get his coverage and his care in order. She ordered Joe's factor and made sure it got to him on the same day every month. She'd call to make sure everything arrived in order and check in on him periodically to make sure that he was keeping up with his care. Kara works for NCHS, the specialty pharmacy and healthcare organization, and this is what she does. She takes some of the hassle out of everyday life with a bleeding disorder. So Joe was able to focus on his self-care without having to spend hours on the phone with doctors, pharmacies, or insurers. His factor and supplies showed up on time every month in the right quantities, and if there was ever a problem, he could just call Kara. She just made life easier. NCHS, we care for life. Were you questioning, like, what do I do here as an 18-year-old? Am I supposed to be in school? Am I supposed to be home? Was that, was that a hard battle for you mentally? Oh, yeah. It, um, I spent a lot of time wondering that. So, you know, of course, we had the funeral, which I went home for, and that, that was kind of the easy part. But when I came back, and I had a lot of times where I sat in my room and I wondered, you know, I, I keep leaving my mother by herself and my sister. I don't know what to do. But, again, I have... Uh, my opinion, the greatest mother on earth and one of the strongest women I've ever uh, been around. And um, she was the one I leaned on, which is not fair to her, but, but that's what happened. So I have a real strong family support staff. That's what got me through it. My family is my number one purpose in life and why, right, that I was talking about. And that's how I cope with, with any adversities that I come upon. And Josh, what about for you through your your collegiate career, your professional career, you know, you've played with uh, five teams, but moving around a lot, you know, yeah. it's a very, it's a life on the go in, in, in yeah. many regards. And we talked about that a little bit before. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have intersections where the pro professional demands on you and, and where your family was uh, personally were challenging to negotiate? Um, now, the first couple of years in the league, I was by myself, singling and mingling, you know, so. <laughs> well, yeah. Is that your big move right yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> So you moved in, you know, I just pack up my two suitcases, put my TV in my car, and I just go to the next city. But, you know, you got a family, yeah, that's, it's tough. You know, you got to, now you got to pack up diapers and high chairs and packing plays and her stuff, you know. But, but yeah, that, that's one thing that remained constant was, like, my family, you know, my, my family and then my, you know, immediate family, mom and everybody. You know, always, when, when other things changed in my professional life, you know, that, that family stayed constant, so... Definitely was good to lean on those guys, and you know I tell them all the time, you know y'all helped me get through it all, you know having, having all that change. And Justin, to come to come back to you, you in college, in addition to playing football, and you you recalled an experience you had had as a kid when you visited a certain agency of the government, and that that started you on the path that you've been on now. Can you give us a little uh, background on that? <clears throat> when I was in uh, middle school, actually, I did we did a field trip to Washington D.C., which was. I was on the other side of the world for me at the time. <laughs> During this trip, we visited the uh, FBI building, the headquarters there in Washington, D.C., and, and man, I just remember thinking how cool it was, and thinking back about it, law enforcement is kind of my passion, I think, and it started when I was six, when I felt the need to take care of my mother, take care of people, right, and make sure everybody's safe, and, and I love it. I love to do it. So I did get out of college, and I applied with uh, Dallas Police Department, I uh, got on with Dallas Police Department, um, but about five months into my training, DEA called me. I'd applied with them before, and so I left for Quantico uh, in January of 2004. What does a DEA agent in broad strokes do? Obviously, we investigate you know, narcotics, uh, violations of narcotics laws, federal narcotics laws. And that can be everything from sitting at a desk doing a report to the financial investigations at the computers to all the office stuff. Moving out into surveillance, um, you know, doing undercover buys or all kinds of operations outside of the office. I don't love sitting in an office. I'm not good at it. 
I need to be moving around. So it gives me a lot of, um, you know, uh, the ability to do that quite a bit. You spent most of your career in Detroit, and that's been home for, for quite some time. Yeah. And for better or for worse, as you said, there's, uh, there's plenty of work for you as a DEA agent in Detroit. You know, I maybe should have mentioned this at the beginning. So a few years ago, there was an, uh, an interest in trying to expand awareness of the DEA and trying to get more applicants to, to the DEA. Um, so they were, uh, or some organization was looking at doing a TV show to profile what it, what it was like to be a part of the DEA, and they selected the, the branch in Detroit to profile. So for, what would you say, uh, six months? About six months. I All right, I got that one right. For about six months, uh, you had a film crew following you for this television show where you can see Justin's face on DEA Detroit. You can go home tonight and look it up. It was a Spike TV show. How do you function as a DEA agent when you have a film crew with you for six months? They made it work, honestly. I thought that my opinion of the show, I, I didn't have high expectations, honestly, of it. But when it started, but uh, after we, you know, concluded and it came out, it really it did a good job of depicting kind of what we what we do on, uh, in a broad, you know, manner. Without getting too in the way of the actual work. Correct. Yeah. When we think about obstacles and challenges, obviously playing in the NFL, it's very exciting. It's a very positive thing. Playing the Super Bowl, very exciting, very positive, very stressful, very challenging as well. I'm sure. So just curious to know, in the week that is leading up to the Super Bowl, that huge event. Then that event itself, whether it's pressure from family and friends who are trying to get tickets or it's <laughs> trying to negotiate, you know, PR thing or whatever it may be. What are some of the things that people don't necessarily know that you're having to face and how did you negotiate that? Yeah, the, the tickets would be a, a hot topic. <laughs> um, I know that year they was going for around, well, we could buy them for $900 a piece. So you couldn't buy too many for your family. <laughs> that was my first year. I got two free, so I... I got those two and gave them to my mom, my dad. Don't tell nobody else this, y'all. But if you go back <laughs> no, and watch, it'll be a big secret. <laughs> Shut the cameras off, guys. Yeah, shut it down. Shut it down. If you go back and watch the Super Bowl, I was I was actually inactive for the game, you know. So I was I was on the sideline, but I was part of the team. You, you know? were part of yeah, the team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All in all, you're still part of the team. That's another thing I kind of dealt with past the Super Bowl was like, you know, I had the ring. And sorry, I didn't bring the ring. That's okay. I we'll forgive you for not bringing the ring. Yeah, I dealt with that kind of afterwards, like. You know, do I really deserve a ring? Like, I didn't play in the game. But, you know, over time, you know, just talking to other people, you know, like, no, nah, man, you should really be proud, you know, proud of whatever you do, you know, being a part of that, being at that level, whatever level, whatever you're doing, you know. You might not be the one in the camera, but it's always got to be people, you know, in the background that make, that's making the engine work. But, you know, it reminds me, Justin, of what you were saying earlier about playing for each other and playing for the team. And we talk in this community about how bleeding disorders, you know, there might be one person in the family who's got it, but it's a family disorder. It affects everybody. When you have a nucleus, whether it's a team, you know, whether you're the one out in front yeah. or not, whether you do the, the exciting part or not, um, it's affecting everybody, and everybody has to work together to get to that common goal, or else no one's going to get there, and no one's going to be in front of the camera or having that glory moment. So Justin's a, a, our guest. We try to bring people in from outside the community who have faced obstacles, obstacles and challenges in, in ways that they have an interesting perspective. And as a DEA agent with some substantial losses in your life, you certainly fit the bill. Um, but Josh is actually part of this community. His nephew has severe hemophilia and an inhibitor. He has a foundation that he started to help support people with hemophilia called the Josh Gordy Hope Foundation. He has a scholarship that he does in collaboration with, uh, with uh, NHF. So is there anything that you want to touch on with regard to hemophilia? Well, I mean, you, you covered it pretty well. Um, definitely when, when Nolan was born, that's when we first learned about it, which I'm sure a lot of you know, people in the room probably had the same situation. I did always say if I made it to the NFL, I wanted to use that platform, not knowing that I would make it. You know, I said if I did make it, I wanted to make the best of it and wanted to use that platform for whatever advantage I could. And, um, and that was you know, definitely what was close to my heart. We started a nonprofit back in 12, 2012, an educational scholarship that we do every year. Uh, we just had our 5K July 15th down in Georgia. It went well. Did it in a new location, which was a little shaky, but we got it done, and it, <laughs> we had a good turnout. That pretty much sums it up. Um, nephew's doing great. Just got his learner's permit. Um, you know, it comes up a lot when I, when I talk to people about hemophilia or bleeding disorders, and they say, you know, are there... Uh, are there celebrity faces out there? And, you know, I get into the history of the community and what health was like, you know, in the 50s and 60s and then what we went through in the 70s and 80s and, you know, the reasons that we don't have those people. And um, I just personally am always thankful how active you have been and continue to be for this community with the platform that you have that you can use that for good and you point that good toward the hemophilia community. Um, thank you for continuing to do that. My pleasure. My pleasure.
NCHS believes in being a proactive partner in their patients' care, which means providing services like arranging convenient and discreet delivery, encouraging adherence to therapies, and monitoring your therapy outcomes. They also provide reimbursement services to help with navigating insurance requirements, which can be overwhelming for families affected by a bleeding disorder or chronic disease. And with a pharmacist available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, NCHS can offer comfort to patients that someone will always be there when needed. Check out their website to learn more, nchswecare.com, or call 877-626-6247. Again, that is 877-626-6247. So some questions for the two of you guys, and, and in uh, a few minutes I'll, I'll open up as well if anybody out here has questions as well. I'll start this with, with you, Justin. Um, you know, you're, both, you're both what I would consider like tough guys, strong guys, both physically, mentally. You both have done stuff in life that I think qualifies as, as strong, tough men. But we were talking, Justin, just yesterday about moments where you, know, you felt that rattled. And so I'm curious to know from both of you, we'll start with Justin. When has there been a moment in your life where you suddenly felt as though, oh, I'm, I'm not invincible or, you know, felt particularly weak or defeated. Yeah. After I got done playing, you know, college football and I start with the Dallas Police Department, I become a DEA agent. I'm 24 years old. I'm invincible, right? I'm the toughest guy in the world. And I started having pains in my legs. You know, again, I think there's, there couldn't be anything wrong with me. Uh, so I ignored it and ignored it. And um, um, finally it got to a point where I couldn't really put, you know, weight on my leg. So I went into a doctor and, and um, he's looking at me, he doesn't really know what's going on. He said, well, we'll do an ultrasound, make sure there's no, you know, blood clotting. And so they took me in and did the ultrasound on my leg and turned out I did, in fact, have a blood clot that ran from my ankle to my knee. They rushed me from there up to, the, to, the, to a hospital bed, slam IVs in my arm, they're, they're pumping me full of uh, 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 blood thinners. And uh, I, I remembered uh, what, we were, what you were talking about when I was laying there and I'm I realized how very serious this is, and it hit me, really, it really hit me that I'm not invincible and, uh, you know, uh, very vulnerable, actually. And, man, what a, what a uh, well, terrifying feeling, first of all, eye-opening, you know, just all of this in, in a moment. <laughs> so I laid there for about a week in that bed and had nothing but that to think about, and, um, man, it, it, uh, it was tough. It was really tough. So... Um, you know, I don't have anyone affected by hemophilia directly in my family, but I, do have, I did have this situation, and so I can appreciate. It can be a lonely feeling, right? I, this is why this is happening to me kind of thing, you know? I've done everything I should do, and I've been healthy, and I've worked out, and I'm, you know, I'm in law enforcement. I'm taking care of people. I'm, I'm on my way, and then all of a sudden this. But again, I go back to uh, what I lean on, which is a couple of things. Uh, for me at that time, my purpose in life, right, is my family always. That's always my purpose. But then now I have my team that I work with. They depend on me, right, They're, and they need me. So I use those things in my mind to be strong and, and figure out a way to cope with this, uh, you know, and, and get through it. So, you know, ultimately it, it worked out and, and everything's good and uh, here we are. So, Was there anything that changed in your behavior after that moment of vulnerability that you can pinpoint? In my line of work, unfortunately, I can't be I can't be scared I, my guys depend on me to, to not be that so in my mind I, I had to get past it and, and do what I had to do to take care of my people right and that's that's what it was for me I it, it just it, I had to move on and I did so uh, definitely aware though right more sure. aware what about for you Josh any moment that kind of akin to that for you I think um, the one that sticks out to me uh, going back to my rookie year training camp um, you got you to imagine you've just came out of college, you know, you've been one, probably, you know, one of the top ten guys on your team, so, you know, you always know you got a secure role on the team, secure starting spot and all that good stuff. But being in rookie training camp as an undrafted free agent guy, you know, you're going through the weeks, you're knocking the weeks out, you're feeling comfortable, you're thinking you're doing, doing what you're supposed to do, you get to week three of the preseason, then bam, all of a sudden you're released, and now you're back home on your, on your, on your mama's couch, and you're like, like, man, what's next? You know, and, and at that time, it really, it really brings you down, humbles you. You know, even though it was a blessing, you know, it can be taken from you any minute, any moment. And just out of the blue, got a call from Green Bay. So uh, from that, that point on, I said, hey, I, I'm leaving. I ain't coming back. You know, so once I got up there, I made sure I just 
you know, gave all the, all the effort I had, you know, and it was success from there. Sometimes setting that goal, at least speaking for myself, it can seem so great that I get overwhelmed by the idea yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me to know, like, what's the first step? Or if I take a step or two and, and, and fall down, it feels like, ah, forget it, that's too far away. Yeah. So how do you, once you have that goal, how do you set yourself up so that you can be successful early enough to build some momentum and keep yourself on the path? You know, you, you got a goal in mind. You know, if you, if you want to be a whatever, DEA agent, you know, professional athlete, doesn't matter. You got that goal, you set it in front of you, and you, you repeat it, you see it every day. You know, you know what you got to do to get there. Study the ones who did it, did it before you. You know, what, what disciplines did they do to keep themselves on track? You know, for, for me, it's, you know, when it's time to train, it's time to train. It's time to eat right, you got to eat right. Getting 10 hours of sleep is optimal. You know, you got to do it, keep your body healthy. So, you know, just, just sitting that goal out there in front of you, seeing it and just staying fixed on it. When you had a big goal, then obviously you got to break it down into subset goals. Same thing, I want to be an athlete, you know, how many hours a day am I training? What kind of film study am I doing? I think it's just breaking it down into smaller goals so you won't be, like I said, overwhelmed with the big picture. And, you know, you tackle those small goals and it triggers something in your brain. I knock that off, okay, cool. Next step, oh, I knock that off. I made it a habit. You know, you make goals and you got to make them a habit. They say it takes, what, 21 days to make something a habit? Yeah, I think that's the, the know, benchmark you, that they say. You know, you go working out for 21 days, now there's nothing to get up at 5 a.m. and go get it in, and now I can focus on the next goal. So I think that was perfect. And I think it is important. The big goal is where it starts, but making right. sure that you have your, your goals after that so that you know the path by which you plan to get to the big goal. Justin, what would you say about the role of discipline in your life and why it's important for people, especially people who are facing uh, exceptional challenges, to, to find that discipline? In my life, discipline is, is, is everything. I pride myself on it. So I, to get into whatever you're deciding to get in, I think, like you said, it is critical, right? And you're going to run into obstacles. You're going to have adversities. And, and we have to figure out a way to get through them, right? We talked about that. And I got, I got to share this with you. I do not mean to be cheesy, guys. I don't. But this is one of my favorite. I, I ran into this uh, a few years ago. It's a motivational poster, basically. And I'm sure you've, some have seen it. But I, this, I live by this. And when I run into adversity, I say it to myself. And I mean, it fires me up every single time. But it, it reads, fate whispers to the warrior, you cannot weather the storm. And the warrior replies, I am the storm. That sums up how I, how I, how I try to carry myself everywhere I go. Things get crazy. They get chaotic, with it, whether it's uh, you know, an illness or a or, or whatever it is, your work, whatever's happening to you, your grade, your school's bothering you, whatever's happening, just think to yourself, you know, I'm the storm. I'm going to fight for this. I'm going to get through it, right? And I, and I don't mean to be cheesy, guys, truly. That, I have that hanging on my wall in my office at home. That's what this tattoo says on my arm. And, I mean, I live it. I try to live it every day. It's a phenomenal thing to read every once in a while just to remind yourself that, that you can do it. You can get through anything, absolutely anything. All right, I got to fill in the blank for you. The best piece of advice I ever received was? I'll give you a quote that I got one time, and, and this one is not, you know, not as powerful as the other, but my uncle said to me one time, so if you fail to plan, plan to fail. And I was about 14 when it happened, when he said it to me, and I was like, man, it's still simple, but it's so true. So I make plan, I try to plan whatever goals I have in life or whatever I'm trying to accomplish, I got to have a plan to get there, right? And I think, I think it's great advice, and it's pretty simple, too. So, uh, What about for you, Josh? Probably be, uh, never be afraid to stop learning. I forgot who said it, but it, it said if, um, if it's somebody, somebody say they know it all, then they probably don't know nothing at all. You know, If you're ever the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> you, know, you, can, you go to another room, you can always learn something. So uh, that's probably my... I like that. I've never heard that. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. The wrong I don't room. have to worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're like working undercover right now or something. I don't, yeah. I don't trust that at all. The National Hemophilia Foundation, the national, the larger of the two national organizations that we have, uh, was really started by moms. You know, moms trying to understand before we had the treatments that we have today and the care we have today, moms was trying to figure it out, working together to figure it out. Um, you're both family men and, and fathers, but you also both grew up 
with mothers. Um, and I'm curious to know about the role that your moms have played in your lives and developing you into, into the men you are. Um, so whoever would like to take that first, can you speak a little bit to how your mom influenced you? From my perspective, my mom, she was a single mom until I was eight. So she's definitely always been, had to be strong, you know. As from the year I was born to probably five years ago, she worked, you know, she worked at Walmart. So that's, that's all I knew, her getting up early in the morning, working, um, working, coming home, and doing what she had to do. But, you know, taking me to my first uh, recreation football game, she did play a vital role. Do you think that helped to impact your work ethic and discipline, watching her as a single mom kind of oh, yeah. getting up, going to work, and fighting the good fight? Oh, yeah, because, I mean, even when you're a kid, you see it's a lot of work, but you don't really don't know how much it was until you get your own kids. <laughs> you know, so I was like, man, you know, hats off to her. You know, I always try to show her I love her any time I get, you know, and, you know, definitely pay it back, you know, whatever it be, so... What about for you, Justin? Yeah, like, well, I'd already said before, she, my mother's um, one of the strongest women I've ever met. And so, like, at six years old, my sister was four. She becomes a single mother, runs with it, doesn't show us the obvious devastation that she felt, right? We didn't see that from her. So just learning that strength from her, uh, her going to work every day, she's never stopped that, never. She's the matriarch of our, my whole entire family. So um, everything I... Uh, Everything I am is because of her, no doubt about it. I tell her to her face, and hopefully she'll get to see this, because I, I, I don't tell her enough. That's just one of those things you, you forget to say it, but um, I, could, I wouldn't be here without her. So you're both in, in the last couple of years in new phases of your professional lives. So when we talk about that big goal and going after that goal, can you state today what your goal is when you think about yourself as a professional? What, what is your goal today and, and maybe how it's different from what it was five years ago when you were in the NFL and before you were in this role now, Justin? So yeah, I think now I'm just striving to be a professional father, professional husband, you know, and be there for my family, you know, provide for them the best that I can. I've really transitioned and, you know, got uh, different values in life now. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And for you, Justin? For me, like you said, I, we started this SRT program, and they made me the team leader, which I was uh, I didn't deserve, but I, I, I gladly take it. Um, so my goal right now is to make this thing work the way DEA wants it to work. It's new to, to our agency, so so professionally, that that's my kind of my goal right now. And then my family, like I said, my kids are, are my whole world. We're getting ready to start football Monday. That takes the rest of my time, and so my goal is just to be a, a, a good dad. Again, thinking about putting, putting this particular conversation together, you are both men. And when I think about, like, what is a, what is a man like? You know, you, you both fit that mold in a way for, for me because of what you've accomplished. But then when I, knowing you guys a bit now and, and hearing you speak and being open about vulnerabilities and challenges and the priorities in your life, your family, and doing the right thing, I think that's really important. And I think that's important for us to remind ourselves you know, we with bleeding disorders and with hemophilia, especially those of us who care to be athletically inclined and want to be physical and are significantly challenged in that regard, there are, there are moments of self-doubt and identity crises and, and looking at people like the two of you and thinking like, oh man, like, oh, I have no idea what that's like. But then these conversations reveal that we're all just human. We all face challenges. We all have vulnerabilities. And it's about how you navigate those, the perspectives that you have, the discipline that you enact in your life to reach the goals that you want that really define who you are and the kind of character that you present to the world. And I think this conversation that came through. So thank you both for being here. Thank you, Justin, and thank you, Josh, for participating in Powering Through. And thank you, Melissa Compton, the Lone Star Chapter and the Texas Bleeding Disorders Conference for inviting us to be a part of your meeting. And of course, thank you to NCHS for your ongoing support of Powering Through. If you'd like to see video from this Powering Through conversation, you'll find it at poweringthrough.org, along with more podcasts and more videos of other Powering Through events. And that will do it for Episode 8 of the Powering Through podcast. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back next month with another episode featuring another great conversation. Remember to subscribe to the Powering Through podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. You can also stream our podcast episodes, watch videos of other conversations, or learn about upcoming Powering Through events by visiting poweringthrough.org. Thank you, NCHS, for supporting the Powering Through podcast. Learn more about NCHS and their services by visiting nchswecare.com, where you will also find links to their social media accounts. 
and bloodstreammedia.com is your one-stop shop to stream, subscribe, and enjoy all of Bloodstream Media's podcasts for the Bleeding Disorders community. This episode of the Powering Through Podcast was written by Patrick James Lynch, produced and distributed by Andrew Gall, Patrick James Lynch, Aubrey Friedman, Colby Crow, Ryan Geelan, Rob Bradford, and Joshua Sterling Bragg. Artwork created by Ryan Geelan and Katie Wright Mead, and the Powering Through Podcast is edited by Mr. Andrew Gall. My name is Patrick James Lynch, and until next time, take self-care of yourself.